from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Room with a View by Tanith Lee This is it, then? Oh, yes. As you can see, it's in quite nice condition. Yes, it is. Clothes there, on the bed, cutlery in the box, basin, cooker. The meter's the same as the one you had last year, and you saw the bathroom across the corridor. Yes, thank you. It's all fine. Well, as I said, I was sorry we couldn't let you have your other room, but you didn't give us much notice, and right now, August, and such good weather, we're booked right up. I understand. It was kind of you to find me this room. I was lucky, wasn't I? the very last one. It's usually the last to go, this one. How odd. It's got such a lovely view of the sea and the bay. Well, I didn't mean there was anything wrong with the room. Of course not. Mr. Tinker always used to have this room. Every year, four months, June to September. Oh, yes. It was quite a shock last year when his daughter rang to cancel. He died just the night before he meant to take the train to come down. Heart attack. What a shame. Yes, it was. Well, I'll leave you to get settled in. You know where we are if you want anything. Thank you very much, Mrs. Rice. Mr. Tinker, she thought, leaning on the closed door. Tinker. Like a dog with one black ear. Here, Tinker. Don't be silly, she thought. It's just nerves. Arrival nerves, by the sea nerves, by yourself nerves. Caroline crossed to the window. She stared out at the esplanade where the brightly colored summer people were walking about in the late afternoon sun. Beyond the bay opened its arms to the sea. The little boats in the harbor lay stranded by an outgoing tide. The water was cornflower blue. If David had been here, she would have told him that his eyes were exactly as blue as that sea, which wasn't at all the case. How many lies there had been between them, even lies about eye color. But she wasn't going to think of David. She had come here alone, as she had come here last season, to sketch, to paint, to meditate. It was a pity about not being able to have the other room. It had been larger, and the bathroom had been contained rather than Sheridan across the hall. But then she hadn't been going to take the holiday flat this year. She had been trying to patch things up with David, until finally all the patching had come undone, and she'd grasped at this remembered place in a panic. I must get away. Caroline turned her back to the window. She glanced about. Yes, of course it was quite all right. If anything, the view was better because the flat was higher up. As for the actual room, it was like all the rooms. Chintz curtains, cream walls, brown rugs, and jolly cushions. And Mr. Tinker had taken good care of it. There was only one cigarette burn on the table. And probably that wasn't Mr. Tinker at all. Somehow she couldn't imagine Mr. Tinker doing a thing like that. It must be the result of the other tenants those people who had accepted the room as their last choice. Well, now, make up the bed and then go out for a meal. No, she was too tired for that. She'd get sandwiches from the little cafe downstairs, perhaps some wine from the off-license. It would be a chance to swallow some sea air, those first breaths that always made her giddy and unsure, like too much oxygen. She made the bed up carefully, as if for two. When she moved it away from the wall to negotiate the sheets, she saw something scratched in the cream plaster. Oh, 
Mr. Tinker, you naughty dog, she said aloud, and then felt foolish. Anyway, Mr. Tinker wouldn't do such a thing, scratch with a penknife or even some of Mrs. Rice's lone cutlery. Black ink had been smeared into the scratches. Caroline peered down into the gloom behind the bed. A room with a view, the scratching said. Well, almost. Whoever it was had forgotten to put in the ultimate double U. A room with a V, either illiterate or careless. Or smitten with guilt nine-tenths, though. She pushed the bed back again. She'd better tell the Rices sometime. God forbid they should suppose she was the vandal. She was asleep when she heard the room breathing. She woke gradually, as if to familiar and reassuring sound. Then, as gradually, a confused fear stole upon her. Presently, she located the breathing sound as a noise of her own blood rhythm in her ears. Then, with another shock of relief, as the sea. But in the end, it was not the sea either. It was the room breathing. A kind of itching void of pure terror sent her plunging upwards from the bed. She scrabbled at the switch, and the bedside light flared on. Blinded and gasping, she heard the sound seep away. Out at sea, a ship moved plaintively. She looked at the window and began to detect stars over the water and the pink lamps glowing along the esplanade. The world was normal. Too much wine after too much train travel. Nightmare. She lay down. Though her eyes watered, she left the light on. I'm afraid so, Mrs. Rice. Someone scratched and inked it on the wall. A nostalgia freak. A room with a view. Funny, said Mrs. Rice. She was a homely woman with jet-black gypsy hair that didn't seem to fit. Of course, there's been two or three had that room. No one for very long. Disgusting. Still, the damage is done. Caroline walked along the bay. The beach that spread from the south side was packed with holiday makers. Everyone was paired, as if they meant to be ready for the ark. Some had a great luggage of children as well. The gulls and the children screamed. Caroline sat drawing, and the children raced screaming by. People stopped to ask her questions about the drawing. Some stared a long while over her shoulder. Some gave advice on perspective and subject matter. The glare of sun on the blue water hurt her eyes. She put the sketchbook away. After lunch, she'd go further along to Jane's Bay, which she recollected had been very quiet last year. This year, it wasn't. After about four o'clock, gangs of local youth began to gather on the esplanade and the beach. Their hair was greased, and their legs were like storks' legs and tight trousers. They whistled. They spoke in an impenetrable mumble, which often flowered into four-letter words, uttered in contrastingly clear diction. There had been no gangs last year. The sun sank. Caroline was still tired. She went along the esplanade to her block, up the steps to her room. When she unlocked the door and stood on the threshold, for a moment, what? It was as if the pre-twilight amber that came into the room was slowly pulsing, throbbing, as if the walls, the floor, the ceiling were... She switched on the overhead lamp. Mr. Tinker, she said firmly, I'm not putting up with this. Pardon, said a voice behind her. Caroline's heart expanded with a sharp thud like a grenade exploding in her side. She spun around, and there stood a girl in jeans and a smock. Her hand was on the door of the shared bathroom. It was a previously unseen neighbor from down the hall. I'm sorry, said Caroline. I must have been talking to myself. The girl looked blank and unhelpful. I'm Mrs. Lacey, she said. She did not look Lacey nor married. She looked about fourteen. You've got number eight, then. How is it? Bloody nerve, Caroline thought. It's fine. They've had three in there before you, said fourteen-year-old Mrs. Lacey. Altogether? Pardon? No. I meant three separate tenants. Nobody would stay. 
all kinds of trouble with that Mrs. Rice. Nobody would, though. Why ever not, Caroline snapped. Too noisy or something, or a smell. I can't remember. Caroline stood in her doorway, her back to the room. Fourteen-year-old Mrs. Lacey opened the bathroom door. At least we haven't clashed in the mornings, Caroline said. Oh, we're always up early on holiday, said young Mrs. Lacey, pointedly. Somewhere down the hall a child began to bang and quack like an insane automatic duck. A man's voice bawled. Hurry up that piss, Brenda, will you? Brenda Lacey darted into the bathroom, and the bolt was shot. Caroline into her room. She slammed the door. She turned on the room, watching it. There was a smell. It was very slight, a strange, faintly buttery smell. Not really unpleasant, probably from the cafe below. She pushed up the window and breathed the air. As she leaned on the sill breathing, she felt the room start breathing too. She was six years old and Auntie Sarah was taking her to the park. Auntie Sarah was very loving. Her fat, warm arms were always reaching out to hold, to compress, to pinion against her fat, warm bosom. Being hugged by Auntie Sarah induced in six-year-old Caroline a sense of claustrophobia and primitive fright. Yet somehow she was aware that she had to be gentle with Auntie Sarah and not wound her feelings. Auntie Sarah couldn't have a little girl, so she had to share Caroline with Mummy. And now they were in the park. There's Jenny, said Caroline. But of course, Auntie Sarah wouldn't want to let Caroline go to play with Jennifer. So Caroline pretended that Auntie Sarah would let her go. And she ran very fast over the green grass towards Jenny. Then her foot caught in something. When she began to fall, for a moment it was exhilarating, like flying. But she hit the ground, stunning, bruising. She knew better than to cry. For in another moment, Auntie Sarah had reached her. It doesn't hurt, said Caroline. But Auntie Sarah took no notice. She crushed Caroline to her. Caroline was smothered on her breast, and the great round arms bound her like a hot, faintly dairy scented bolsters. Caroline started to struggle. She pummeled, kicked, and shrieked. It was dark, and she had not fallen in the grass after all. She was in bed in the room, and it was the room she was fighting. It was the room which was holding her close, squeezing her, hugging her. It was the room which had the faint cholesterol smell of fresh milk and butter. It was a room which was stroking and whispering. But of course, it couldn't be the damn room. Caroline lay back exhausted, and the toils of her dream receded. Another nightmare. Switch on the light. Yes, that was it. Switch on the light and have a drink from the small traveler's bottle of gin she'd put ready in case she couldn't sleep. Christ, she shielded her eyes from the light. Distantly she heard a child crying, the offspring probably of young Mrs. Unlacy Lacy, along the hall. God, I must have yelled, Caroline said aloud, yelled and been heard. The unlacy Lacys were no doubt discussing her this very minute. The mad, lazy slut in number eight. The gin burned sweetly, going down. This was stupid. The light, no, she'd have to leave the light on again. Caroline looked at the walls. She could see them very, very softly lifting, softly sinking. Don't be a fool. The smell was just discernible. It made her queasy. Too rich. Yet a human smell, a certain sort of human smell, bovine, she concluded, exactly like poor childless Sarah. It was hot, even with the window open. She drank halfway down the bottle and didn't care any more. Mr. Tinker, why ever are you interested in him? Mrs. Rice looked disapproving. I'm sorry. I'm not being ghoulish, it's just, well, it seems such a shame his dying like that. I suppose I've been brooding. Don't want to do that. You need company. Is your husband coming down at all this year? David, 
No, he can't get away right now. Pity. Yes, but about Mr. Tinker. All right, said Mrs. Rice. I don't see why I shouldn't tell you. He was a retired man. Don't know what line of work he'd been in, but not very well paid, I imagine. His wife was dead. He lived with his married daughter, and really I don't think it suited him, but there was no alternative. Then, four months of the year, he'd come here and take number eight. Done it for years. Used to get his meals out. Must have been quite expensive. But I think the daughter and husband paid for everything, you know, to get a bit of time on their own. But he loved this place, Mr. Tinker did. He used to say to me, Here I am home again, Mrs. Rice. The room with his daughter, I had the impression he didn't think of as that home at all. But number eight, well, he put his ornaments and books and pieces around. My George, even put a couple of nails in for him to hang a picture to. Why not? And number eight got quite cozy. It really was Mr. Tinker's room in the end. My George said that that's why other tenants fight shy. They could feel it waiting for Mr. Tinker to come back. But that's a lot of nonsense, and I can see I shouldn't have said it. No, I think your husband was absolutely right. Poor old room. It's going to be disappointed. Well, my George, you know, he's a bit of an idiot. The night, the night we heard, he got properly upset, my George. He went up to number eight and opened the door and told it. I said to him, you want me to hang black curtains in there next? Beyond the fence, the headland dropped away in dry grass and the feverish flowers of late summer to a blue sea ribbed with white. North spread the curved claw of Jane's Bay and the gray vertical of the lighthouse. But the sketch pad and pencil case sat on the seat next to Carolyn. She had attempted nothing. Even the novel lay closed. The first page hadn't seemed to make sense. She kept reading the words home and tinker between the lines. She understood she was afraid to return to the room. She had walked along the headlands, telling herself that all the room had wrong with it was sadness, a bereavement, that it wasn't waiting that it wasn't alive, and anyway. Even sadness didn't happen to rooms. If it did, it would have to get over that, get used to being just a holiday flat again. A space which people filled for a few weeks, observed indifferently, cared nothing about, and then went away from, which was all absurd because none of it was true, except that she wasn't the only one to believe. She wondered if David would have registered anything in the room. Should she ring him and confide in him? Ask advice? No. For God's sake, that was why she was imagining herself into this state, wasn't it? So she could create a contact with him again? No. David was out, and out David would stay. It was five o'clock. She packed her block and pencils into her bag and walked quickly along the grass verge above the fence. She would walk into King's Cliff at this rate and get a meal. She wondered who the scared punster had been, the one who knew French. She'd got the joke by now. A room with a vie, a room with a life. She reached King's Cliff and had a pleasantly unhealthy meal, with a pagoda of white ice cream and glacé cherries to follow. In the dusk, the town was raucous and cheerful, Raspberry and yellow neon splashed and spat. The motorbike gang seemed suitable, almost friendly in situ. Caroline strolled by the walk stalls and across the car park through an odor of frying donuts, chips, and fierce fish. She went to a cinema and watched a very bad and very pointless film with a sense of superiority and tolerance. When the film was over, she sat alone in a pub and drank vodka. Nobody accosted her or tried to pick her up. She was glad at first, but after the fourth vodka, rather sorry. She had to run to catch the last bus back. It was not until she stood on the esplanade, the bus vanishing, the pink lamps droning solemnly in the black water far below, that a real and undeniable terror came and twisted her stomach. The cafe was still open, and she might have gone in there, but some of the greasy stork legs she had seen previously were clustered about the counter. She was tight 
and visualized sweeping amongst them, ignoring their adolescent nastiness. But presently, she turned aside and into the block of holiday flats. She dragged up the steps sluggishly. By the time she reached her door, her hands were trembling. She dropped her key and stifled a squeal as the short-time automatic call lights went out. Pressing the light button, she thought, supposing it doesn't come on. But the light did come on. She picked up her key, unlocked the door, and went determinedly inside the room, shutting the door behind her. She experienced it instantly. It was like a vast, indrawn, sucking gasp. No, Carolyn said to the room. Her hand fumbled with a switch, and the room was lit. Her heart was beating so very fast. That was, of course, what made the room also seem to pulse, as if its heart were also swiftly and greedily beating. Listen, Caroline said. Oh, God, talking to a room, but I have to, don't I? Listen, you've got to stop this. Leave me alone, she shouted at the room. The room seemed to grow still. She thought of the laces and giggled. She crossed to the window and opened it. The air was cool. Stars gleamed above the bay. She pulled the curtains to and undressed. She washed and brushed her teeth at the basin. She poured herself a gin. She felt the room all about her. Like an inhaled breath, impossibly prolonged. She ignored that. She spoke to the room quietly. Naughty Mr. Tinker, to tinker with you like this. Have to call you Sarah now, shan't I? Like a great big womb. That's what she really wanted, you see. To squeeze me right through herself. Pop me into her womb. I'd offer you a gin. But where the hell would you put it? Caroline shivered. No, this is truly silly. She walked over to the cutlery box beside the baby cooker. She put in her hand and pulled out the vegetable knife. It had quite a vicious edge. George Rice had them frequently sharpened. See this, Caroline said to the room. Just watch yourself. And she laid down the darkness world, carousing her to asleep. In the womb, it was warm and dark, a warm blood dark. Rhythms came and went, came and went, placid and unending as the tides of the sea. The heart organ pumped with a soft, deep noise like a muffled drum. How comfortable and safe it was. But when am I to be born? Caroline wondered. Never, the womb told her, lapping her, cushioning her. Caroline kicked out. She floated. She tried to seize hold of something, but the blood-warm cocoon was not to be seized. Let me go, said Caroline. Auntie Sarah, I'm all right. Let me go. I want to, please. Her eyes were wide, and she was sitting up in her holiday bed. She put out her hand spontaneously towards the light and touched the knife she had left beside it. The room breathed regularly deeply. Caroline moved her hand away from the light switch and saw the darkness. This is ridiculous, she said aloud. The room breathed. She glanced at the window. She had left the curtains drawn over and so could not focus on the esplanade beyond or the bay, the outer world. The walls throbbed. She could see them. She was being calm now and analytical, letting her eyes adjust, concentrating. The mammalian milky smell was heavy not precisely offensive, but naturally rather horrible under these circumstances. Very carefully, Caroline, still in darkness, slipped her feet out of the covers and stood up. All right, she said. All right, then. She turned to the wall behind the bed. She reached across and laid her hand on it. The wall. The wall was skin. It was flesh live pulsing hot moist it was the wall swelled under her touch it adhered to her hand eagerly the whole room writhed in a little surging towards her it wanted she knew it wanted to clutch her to its breast caroline ripped her hand from the flesh wall its rhythms were faster and the cow-like smell much stronger caroline whimpered 
She was flung backwards and her fingers closed on the vegetable knife and she raised it. Even as the knife plunged toward, she knew it would skid or rebound from the plaster, probably slicing her. She knew all that, but could not help it. And then the knife thumped in up to the handle. It was like stabbing into, into meat. She jerked the knife away and free it, and scalding fluid ran down her arm. I've cut myself after all. That's blood. But she felt nothing. And the room? The room was screaming. She couldn't hear it, but the scream was all around her, hurting her ears. She had to stop the screaming. She thrust again with a knife. The blade was slippery. The impact was the same. Boneless meat. And the heated fluid this time splashed all over her. In the thick unlight it looked black. She dabbed frantically at her arm, which had no wound, but in the wall. She stabbed again. She ran to another wall and stabbed and hacked at it. I'm dreaming, she thought. Christ, why can't I wake up? The screaming was growing, dim, losing power. Stop it, she cried. The blade was so sticky now she had to use both hands to drive it home. There was something on the floor spreading that she slid on in her bare feet. She struck the wall with her fist, then with a knife. Oh, Christ, please die, she said. Like a butchered animal, the room shuddered, collapsed back upon itself, became silent and immobile. Caroline sat in a chair. She was going to be sick, but then the sickness faded. I'm sitting here in a pool of blood. She laughed, and tears started to run from her eyes, which was the last thing she remembered. When she woke, it was very quiet. The tide must be far out, for even the sea did not sound. A crack of light came between the curtains. What am I doing in this chair? Caroline shifted her mind blank and at peace. Then she felt the utter emptiness that was in the room with her. The dreadful emptiness occasioned only by the presence of the dead. She froze. She stared at the crack of light, then down. Oh no, said Caroline. She raised her hands. She wore black mittens. Her fingers were stuck together. Now her gaze was racing over the room, not meaning to pro trying to escape, but instead alighting on the black punctures, the streaks, the stripes along the wall, now on the black curtains, the black splotches. Her own body was dappled, grotesquely mottled with black. She had one white toe left to her on her right foot. Woodenly she managed to get up. She staggered to the curtains and hauled them open and turned back in the full flood of early sunlight and saw everything over again. The gashes in the wall looked as if they had been accomplished with a drill or a pick. Flaked plaster was mingled with the, with the blood, except that it wasn't blood. Blood wasn't black. Caroline turned away suddenly. She looked through the window, along the esplanade, pale and lived with morning. She looked at the bright sea, with the two or three fishing boats scattered on it, and the blueness beginning to flush sky and water. When she looked at these things, it was hard to believe in the room. Perhaps most murderers were methodical in the aftermath. Perhaps they had to be. She filled the basin again and again, washing herself, arms, body, feet. Even her hair had to be washed. The black had no particular texture, and the basin had diluted. It appeared like a superior kind of park or fountain pen ink. She dressed herself in jeans and shirt filled the largest saucepan with hot water, and washing up liquid, she began to scour the walls. Soon her arms ached, and she was sweating the cold sweat of nervous stability. The black came off easily, but strange tangles of discoloration remained behind in the paint. Above the holes did not ooze. They merely gaped. Inside each of them was chipped plaster and brick, not bone, muscle, or tissue. There was no feel of flesh anywhere. Caroline murmured to herself, When I finished, it was quite matter-of-fact to say that as if she were engaged in a normality. When I finished, I'll go and get some coffee downstairs. I won't tell Mrs. Rice about the holes. No, not yet. 
How can I explain them? I couldn't have caused her that sort of hole with a knife. There's the floor to do yet, and I'd better wash the rugs. I'll do them in the bath when the ghastly laces go out at nine o'clock. When I've finished, I'll get some coffee. And I think I'll ring David. I really think I'll have to when I finish. She thought about ringing David. She couldn't guess what he'd say. What could she say? Come to that. Her back ached now and she felt sick, but she kept on with her work. Presently she heard energetic intimations of the Lacy's visiting the bathroom and the duck child quacking happily. She caught herself wondering why blood hadn't run when the nails were hammered in the walls for Mr. Tinker's pictures. But that was before the room really came to life, maybe. Or maybe the room had taken in the spirit of beautification, like having one's ears pierced for gold earrings. Certainly the knife scratches had bled. Caroline put down the cloth and went over to the basin and was sick. Perhaps I'm pregnant, she thought. And all this is a hallucination of my fecundity. David, I am pregnant, and I stabbed the room to death. David? David? It was a boiling hot day, one of the last fling days of the summer. Everything was blanched by the heat, apart from the apex of the blue sky and the core of the green blue sea. Caroline wore a white dress. A quarter before each hour, she told herself. She would ring David on the hour, ten o'clock, eleven, twelve. Then she would forget. At one o'clock she rang him, and he was at lunch, as she had known he would be really. Caroline went on the pier. She put money into little machines which whizzed and clattered. She ate a sandwich in a cafe. She walked along the sands, holding her shoes by the straps. At half past four, she felt compelled to return. She had to speak to Mrs. Rice about the holes in the walls. And then again, Perhaps she should go up to number eight first. It seemed possible that the dead room would somehow have righted itself. And then, too, there were the washed rugs drying over the bath that the young Lacys might come in and see. Caroline examined why she was so flippant and so cheerful. It was, of course, because she was afraid. She went into the block and abruptly she was trembling. As she climbed the steps, her legs melted horribly and she wished she could crawl pulling herself by her fingers. As she came up to the landing, she beheld Mr. Lacey in the quarter. At least she assumed it was Mr. Lacey. He was overweight and tanned, a peachy gold by the sun. He stood glowering at her, blocking the way to her door. He's going to complain about the noise, she thought. She tried to smile, but no smile would oblige. I'm Mr. Lacey, he announced. You met the wife the other day? He sounded nervous rather than belligerent. When Caroline didn't speak, he went on. My Brenda, you see. She noticed this funny smell from number eight. When you come along to the bathroom, you catch it. She was wondering if you left some meat out, forgotten it. No, said Caroline. Well, I'd reckon you ought to be told, said Mr. Lacey. Yes, thank you. I mean... Don't take this the wrong way. But we've got a kid. You can't be too careful. No, you can't. Well, then. He swung himself aside and moved a short way down the corridor toward the lacy flat. Caroline went to her door. She knew he was watching her with his two shining lacy piggy eyes. She turned and stared at him, her heart striking her side in huge bruising blows, until he grunted and went off. Caroline stood before the door. She couldn't smell anything. No, there was nothing, nothing at all. The stink came in a wave out of nowhere. It smote her, and she nearly reeled. It was foul, indescribably foul. And then it was gone. Delicately treading soft, Caroline stepped away from the door. She tiptoed to the head of the stairs. Then she ran. But like someone drawn to the scene of an accident, she couldn't entirely vacate the area. She was sat on the esplanade watching. The day went out over the town and the dust seeped from the sea. In the dusk a police car came and drew up outside the block, later another.
It got dark. The lamps, the neons, and the stars glittered, and Caroline shuddered in her thin frock. The stork legs had gathered at the cafe. They pointed and jeered at the police cars. At the garden pavilion, a band was playing. Far out on the ocean, a great tanker passed, garlanded with lights. At nine o'clock, Carolyn found she had risen and was walking across the esplanade to the holiday block. She walked right through the crowd of stork legs. Got the time, one of them yelled, but she paid no heed, didn't even flinch. She went up the steps, and on the first flight she met two very young policemen. You can't come up here, miss. But I'm staying here, she said. Her mild voice, so reasonable, interested her. She missed what he asked next. I said, what number, miss? Number eight. Oh, right. You'd better come up with me, then. You hang on here, Brian. They climbed together like old friends. What's the matter, she questioned him, perversely. I'm not quite sure, miss. They reached the landing. All the way up from the landing below, the stench had been intensifying, solidifying. It was unique. Without ever having smelled such an odor before, instinctively, and at once she knew it was the perfume of rottenness, of decay and death. Mrs. Rice stood in the quarter, her black hair in curlers, and she was absent-mindedly crying. Another woman, with a handkerchief to her nose, patted Mrs. Rice's shoulder. Behind a shut door, a child also cried, vehemently. Another noise came from the bathroom, someone vomiting. Caroline's door was wide open. A further two policemen were on the threshold. They seemed to have no idea of how to proceed. One was wiping his hands with a cloth, over and over. Caroline gazed past them into the room. Putrescent lumps were coming away from the walls. The ceiling dribbled and dripped. Yet one moment only was it like the flesh of a corpse. Next moment it was plaster paint and crumbling brick, and then again like flesh. And then again, Christ, one of the policemen said. He faced about at his audience. He too was young. He stared at Caroline randomly. What are we supposed to do? Caroline breathed in the noxious air. She managed to smile at last, kindly, inquiringly, trying to help. Bury it?